Hello everyone, this is Inji Nosh, a PhD student at the Freiburg University in the Galaxy team. And today I will be guiding through, guiding you through one of the metagenomics training where we are going to detect and track some of the pathogens in the example of this training in food samples. And throughout the training, you will learn about the workflow created within Galaxy, which is openly available. You can use it anytime, you can adapt it. The only thing that you will deal with here is a nanopore data sets, but you'll also learn that you can adapt the workflow to any other type of sequencing technique you, you have. So by reaching this point in your training in general within Galaxy, so you have already learned about the quality controlling, the mapping, and a lot of other stuff about the introduction to Galaxy platform, how you can use the tools, how you can create history, but we will do them together today in order to revise a little bit. So shall we start? So by starting to our training, so as you learned, in order to reach to our training material, you can just simply click here on this hat, and you can you are opened into the galaxy training network and our training today is in the metagenomics part so you scroll down to the metagenomics and it's the last one pathogen detection for direct nanopore sequencing data using galaxy food bond edition so Today we are dealing with the samples from food. So the idea behind that is that we have the, there are a lot of food contamination causing a lot of hospitalization. For example, in Germany, around 137 cases in 2019 and globally 600 million people a year. And mostly from salmonella and other type of, of pathogens. And in order to do, to to deal with it quickly, uh, you have to track it and you have to detect it quickly. So a lot of techniques were, were used before, like um, isolation and targeting specific genes and real-time uh, sampling and a lot of other things. And by that, you are really wasting um, a lot of time. And sometimes you target a little small par portions that may not be a good indication to how much pathogens you can find. So the more you go by time, the more technologies arises and the more techniques were used until the, for example, the home genome sequencing was used, which gives you an overview of the whole microbiome or the, the full uh, cells in your, in your sample. However, it requires isolation, which also requires a lot of time and it's not totally guaranteed to be succeed. So the other thing is to do a direct sequence of old DNA present in the sample, or which is shotgun metagenomic sequencing. And this actually gives you an overview for all the cells. And at the same time, it does not require isolation uh, to your samples before the sequencing. So for the sequencing techniques, you can definitely use Illumina sequencing, but for this uh, part of the the, the training or the way or the workflow that you're going to use today, it's designed or some of the tools that we used are designed for nanopore uh, data sets and choosing nanopore, it's an easier and more practical actually. So it's faster. So if, for example, you are in a factory and you want to check quickly if there is a pathogen or not and where this pathogen is found and so on, you have to be really quick and you have to to have a small, for example, a small device that you can use and directly get your sequence data, put it for in the workflow and detect directly where and, and the, the pathogen is there and if there is a pathogen or not, how many pathogens you are found and so on. So for this reason, we have, we have used and chosen Nanopore technology or Oxford nanopore technology to use in or in our sequencing. So the uh, data sets that we are going to use today is from um, a company called Biletics, where they um, spiked chicken with some known pathogen, which is mainly salmonella or two different strains of salmonella. Then they do a DNA extraction and they did nanopore sequencing directly. 
and we got these um, sequencing files, the fast few files from them. And for our training today, we will be using two of them. Uh, two of them are from Salmonella, but for each one of them is for a different strain. So the main goal of the, the full workflow is to, is to detect blindly, so agnostically, what are the pathogens are there and, and where they are found, maybe the time slot where they, you found the, the pathogen, in which sampling time, for example, and so on. So, but here with this data, we know in prior that we already have Salmonella so that we can test our workflow and you see at the end which exactly the strain and which exactly the, the, the pathogens that we found through our data and a lot of other analysis that we'll have. Okay, so let's start with preparing our galaxy and the history that we have, so creating a history and importing the, the test data sets that you're going to start with. So as a first step, what you're be doing that you click on the plus sign here to create a new history, you name it whatever you want. So for example, pathogen detection, and you click save. The next step is to import your data sets. So you will see here two links for the data sets. You, all you have to do is to press here on copy and you go back into the left far corner in Galaxy to the upload data panel. And you press on fetch, paste and fetch data. And then you click paste, and then click start. An important step to do here in order to, it's actually one of the benefits in Galaxy is to tag your data sets in order to, to see them along your, your analysis and you'll be able to detect them, to, to detect them directly along your, your, all of the analysis and all of the tools that tag keep moving upwards as long as you go. And in, in order to make it or to promote it, all you have to do is to click hashtag and call it whatever you want. So for example, barcode 10, spike two. So barcode 10 is the name or the, the um, an ID to, to mark a specific um, species with a specific strain. And spike two is the spike number two. So the data sets we got from Biolatics were spiked at different time spots, spike one, was in a specific date, spike two in another specific date, spike two B, three, four, and five, and six. So every spike is a specific time point or a specific or a different date. So that at the end, for example, you will see um, a big visualization for all the barcodes. So all of the um, different passages, trains, or species, each one of them, you know at which spike, so you know at which sampling time exactly. In a real-time example, you'll take, for example, a samples at uh, different hours or different days and hundreds of samples or, or 10, for example, 10 different samples, and you'll see a big visualization each, um, each sampling time, whether or not we find pathogens, what are these pathogens, are they related, and so on. So then you'll be able to stop it directly or... Um, or be able to detect it and know where, why exactly it's coming from. So after pressing hashtag and then barcode 10, spike 2, you press enter. Same for the other data sets, it's barcode 11, spike 2b. And you also press enter. An important thing that you have to learn on, for this specific training is that um, the training was designed into two ways, short and long version. The short version is where what we are going to be doing together today, where you will run the created workflows. So as a full picture, there is a big workflow, which is divided into five smaller workflows, each workflow for a specific step. So what you're going to be doing today with the short version is that you'll be running a workflow as a whole to do a specific task for you. 
the long version. So here, after the uh, uploading the data sets, you'll be um, asked to choose between uh, the, the training or the tutorial, either short version or a long version. So make sure that you click one of them. So for today, I will be clicking the short version. But for the long version, it's designed in order to run tool by tool. So step by step, tool by tool, as if you are creating these workflows by hand. So by, do, by today, what we're going to do with the short version that we're going to run the complete workflow as a whole. And at the same time, you will be learning about the tools used in these workflows and how, why exactly which shows them the difference between them and other tools that we did not use and so on. So for today, make sure that you clicked on the short version. So after uploading your data sets, the first step that you learned before, maybe from uh, previous training, uh, from the Galaxy Training Network, that the first step that we need to do is pre-processing, where we um, quality control our reads, we trim, and maybe do some other filtration in order to quality retain the reads and, and make them ready for the analysis. In our case, what we have are this nanopore data sets, so the first step is to do a quality controlling. We will be using some of the known tools like the FastQC and MultiQC that you have been used before in, other, in any other um, sequencing type or techniques. But for example, be using also Nanoplot. This tool is specified for the Nanopore datasets. So it's, it's new for you as well today. So that's what we are going to be using. So we'll be using both of them, MultiQC and Nanoplot. And then after checking the quality, we'll be uh, doing some trimming and filtration using PoreShop and FastP, also designed for the nanopore datasets. And finally, what we want to do is that we want to remove all the host sequencing sequences. So, for example, we have a food sequence um, or samples from food. So what you are interested in now is the pathogens, whether or not there are pathogens. So we are not at all interesting in the interested in the sequences of the host itself. So if, for example, we have a um, sample from cow or um, um, chicken or milk, you don't you are not interested in the milk or chicken or cow sequences. All you have you are interested in are the other sequences or other reads that are unknown for you. Then you will take them and then search for pathogens if there are any or so you all you have to do is to remove the host and proceed with the other sequences that you still have in the sample in order to analyze and test if they are pathogens or not. So part of this pre-processing that we'll be running now is that filtration step where we used um, as um, in, um, a tool called Kraken2. It's designed for taxonomy profiling. So it's, it has, it um, arranged the sequencing, uh, the sequences that you have on the, uh, the, the tree of the um, tree of life. So which shows you the, from the kingdom level down to the species level, for example, and how many reads um, is, the, is set to this kind of kingdom or this kind of this type of species and so on. And in this tool, you can choose one of the standard databases that are in like standard and standard plus PF and so on. And you can also add some other databases through the Galaxy platform. So what we did is that we added another uh, database called Calimary, which is here. You can click on, um, on it here to learn about it. And as long as the training goes, you can click afterwards on any link to read more about any tool or any, um, any database, for example, that we use. The Calimary database is one of the databases that are used recently in removing hosts. And um, in other studies, it's, it was proven that it's doing uh, better in identifying or, um, yeah, so identifying the hosts. And then after you identify them in this step, you start to remove them. Or, and you, we can do this by some tools that we have in Galaxy that do table manipulations like filter tabula and filter sequence by ID. And then after this step, we are now ready with all our sequences that are not hosts. And then take these sequences, sequences and move forward doing the other steps of the training. So... 
What you have to do now in the short version is that you download the workflow from here, like by only by clicking this workflow here. And uh, yeah, okay, so it will start downloading. And then what you have to do is that you go into uh, Galaxy again and we, you import it through the, um, through the URL or upload it from the website. So what you have to do, you press on workflow and you press import. From the import, you can either choose a URL or you can browse where you downloaded the uh, workflows and you can upload it directly from where you have the um, workflow itself. After you import it, you'll find it here in the list of imports. And all what you have to do is to play it. So I will go for the workflow that I have here. You will find its name Nanopore Datasets Preprocessing. So which is the first one. And all yet you have to do is to press on play, which is one workflow. And here you have two samples. So you have to choose the two samples from here. So multiple data sets you will be clicking on, and then you choose one of them. And by clicking import, um, control, you choose the other one. Yeah. And finally, in the hosts to remove a uh, filter, that's actually um, an expression that you can write in order to remove. So what are the species that you are looking for or part of the species name that you are looking for? For here, as a default, we have we have set gallos, which is chicken, homo, homo sapiens, human beings, and boss, which are cows. If you are um, testing your samples um, and you know that the samples are from milk, so you have another um, uh, column like this, or you have another bar like that, and you, you add the other species name or part of the species na name, for example, if you are sure that there are no homo, for example, you can just simply remove it and so on. So here, what I'll be doing is that I will check for Gallos, Homo, and Boss, and what I to remove. So after checking for these, the, the workflow, so in the last step by tabula, tabula manipulation, it filter and removes all these um, hosts that are specified in this step. So what I will be doing here is I run the workflow. So one of the um, Galaxy benefits actually is that you can run a collection. So instead of running um, um, sample by sample, you can also add all the samples that you have in a collection and you can run the workflows um, through these collections instead. So, but currently the, um, the training material or the workflows uh, associated with the training material are set to single file by file. And soonish, we will be adding soon the collection, maybe in another training material or another version. So short, long, and collection version, for example, if you want to try it as well. So it takes, instead of file by file or multiple files, it takes a collection as a whole, and then it uh, does the same kind of analysis. So it's also one of the nicest things you can do in Galaxy to um, select multiple uh, files, for example, like that, and you say that I want to create um, a build dataset list and then maybe call it samples. And then you press create and all you'll have to find is a um, collection with all the datasets inside. Now the workflow has started running. And as you can see, the text that we uh, wrote in the beginning moved upwards uh, along all the analysis that this workflow does. So if I scrolled uh, all the way down, you'll see the input uh, two samples that we have, the collection that we have just done now just for uh, playing around and show you how to create a collection. And now here are the uh, results 
of the running the workflow. The workflow has run twice, one on, on each um, one on each sample, once on each sample, and the output results will be viewed on this very right panel for the results. When it's um, when it's orange, that means it's still running, so the results are not ready yet. When it's gray, that means that time um, has not come to start running the tool, so it's still in the uh, waiting uh, waiting list for the um, for the other. Maybe it depends on uh, previous tools, so the previous tool is still running, so this has to wait for um, for a while to start actually the running. So this step will take um, some time. So for the sake of time, I will go on and show you the results directly in a previous history that I uh, created before for the pre-processing so that we can uh, move on and check the results together. Okay. Yeah, so I had here the same things, the same two data sets, barcode 10, spike 2, and barcode 11, spike 2b. And here, as you can see, all the um, tools has finished the running, so its color now is green. So that means it has finished all the, all the running parts, all the running tools. So going back to the training, Now we are in the pre-processing. We has already uh, we have already run the workflow. We set the specifier into Gallus ho um, Homo and Boss. And you know, in prior, we are uh, spiking chicken. So supposedly, all the hosts that you should be finding now are chicken that you want to remove. And afterwards, and after running this workflow, you should be remaining with remained with all the sequences that are not chicken. Yeah, so for the quality control part that we have in the pre-processing, as we said before, the tools that we used are the FastQC and the Nanoplot. And for trimming and filtering, we used PoreShop and FastP. This is only to, for example, trimming. Um, I'm supposed also that you did the, this part before, but I would be saying quickly in the um, in the Trimming you may be removing the adapters part that you have in your sequences. And these parts, for example, have very low uh, fret score in the quality scoring. So you have to remove them. For example, you remove very short reads, for example, under uh, or below a specific threshold that you know based on your protocol in, in doing the sequences, sequencing. And yeah, so you remove uh, wrong bases or the, and most importantly, the start and the end of the, of the reads themselves with a very bad low quality. So then at the end, you are remained with all the, um, all the data sets that, uh, or, or the reads that are good enough for the analysis. If you want to learn more, also the link for the tutorial quality control is there where you do all the quality controlling and the trimming and everything so you can learn more about that. Another call, a tool called MultiQC is a tool that can group all the uh, quality controlling uh, tools together, uh, I'll put together and gives you very nice uh, HTML reports or tabular reports that you can see before and after what happened um, to your reads, what is the quality before and what's quality after and so on. So let's check together and answer some of the questions. So the question here is that asks us to inspect the quality um, control, the multi-QC output tool for barcode 10. And it asks us how many sequences does barcode 10 had before and after trimming. So how many reads, for example, are removed after trimming. You can also not only uh, check for the multi-QC, but you can also check the FASTP output because it also will, will have a very nice uh, report about that. So what I will be doing here is that, for example, I will go to the HTML, that's for barcode 11, but we want it for barcode 10, now I remembered. Mm, yes. Yeah, 
here, for example, there is a nice HTML that you can see how many reads before filtering. So 14,000, uh, 114,000, and how many are remained after, which is um, 91,000. You can also check the multi QC output, also and the HTML uh, or before and after. So you have here this that's this bar here is for the sequence. This figure here is for the sequence count or number of reads. So here is before the trimming, and here is after the trimming, for example. And you know uh, that was before. It's almost also one hundred fourteen. And here it's 91. So as the report from FASB has shown here, for example, it was the beginning and the end was in the red zone. And then after the trimming, it's all in the yellow zone still. It's a nanopore data set. So that's why it will be, it's averagely seen in the yellow area or the yellow zone of the quality controlling score scheme, but still it's good enough to continue. So um, nanopore data, as you know, they are um, they are improving in terms of the quality scoring. So now actually the the uh, to um, you can trust it by more than actually ninety nine percent, which is better than before, which was really eighty and seventy percent. Now it's really getting better, like other techniques like Illumina sequencing and so on. So you can keep on reading a lot of figures and know more about your set reads and sample but for me now is what uh, to answer the questions here you know now the solution is that before you have 1000 uh what 114k sequencing and after it's 91k and also here uh what is the quality score over the reads before and after trimming so you here have a, um, um, it was below 20 before, and now it's above 20, which is better for us now to continue and to learn generally more about the, the quality control and threat score and why they are important to, to do before they doing the analysis. I recommend you also to go again through the quality controlling training that we had before, that you may have had before, or if not, you can check them throughout the this link through within the galaxy training network as well so for the whole street filtering that we also did in this workflow we're using kraken 2 which is a tool that um, assign all the reads every read to a specific taxa using using the database that we added in um, uh, in galaxy which is calimary the one that we talked about before so the, the things that you know about in prior that you should be seeing a lot of chicken because the host is already from chicken and the they are both of the samples are um, spiked with salmonella so uh, salmonella should be one of the strains or the species i'm sorry species that you can find so let's see and check the kraken 2 output for barcode 10 uh, to answer these following question what is the species of the host and how many uh, sequences of the host was found. So let's see the Kraken 2 output. And as you can see here from uh, the number of lines, so the number of lines here actually are all, um, each one of the line is one of the reads. So you can answer the question by only reading this. So it's 836 reads were found as gallows or was found as chicken. So, or hosts in general. So if you keep kept scrolling, scrolling down, all you will find are all gallows, which is the chicken. And even that we have already in the filtering uh, homo sapiens and boss, since there were no human or uh, cow in the host, so there were no uh, human or cow found, so it's are all chicken. So to answer the question back again here, about what is the species it's the answer is gallows uh, which is chicken and how many sequencing is the number of lines which is um, 836 read so coming up uh, so this part if you ready the um, the output was not ready for you and you want to go directly into the next step you can go on 
and copy the output of the pre-processing workflow directly and fetch it in Galaxy as we did before with the input data sets. And you can proceed with these data sets um, to the next step, which is the taxonomy profiling. So as we said, the output, what is the output of the pre-processing? The output of the pre-processing um, is the reads that are without the hosts. That and also they are um, the reads are quality retained by doing the quality controlling and by doing the um, trimming and with using FastP and PoreShop and by removing the host as we said. So we what we all we need to proceed with are the um, nanopore process sequence reads for barcode eleven and same for barcode ten. The coming step is to do taxonomy profiling. So taxonomy profiling is similar to what we did in the pre-processing. What we did in the pre-processing to remove the host, we used Kraken 2 tool in order to assign a, every read to a specific taxa. So, and then we, by knowing these taxas and by assigning the reads, we say that we don't want the, for example, chicken or homo sapiens or, or boss. Now we, what we have now are the um, filtered or, or uh, pre-processed reads, and we want actually to dig deeper and learn more about uh, what other reads are. So maybe we know in prior which um, bacteria that we have in our, uh, in our samples that might be or might not be a pathogen. So what we'll do in the pre-processing is that we can we will run Kraken 2 tool again, and you can learn more about the Kraken 2, what approach it's used in order to do the, the assignation and what is generally a taxonomy and um, what are what might be a different taxes and what are the different levels or eight level for the taxonomy uh, profiling or the hierarchy. So you can learn more by pressing on the details to read more about the tool and what's taxonomy profiling. So the database that we used here is one of the standard databases in the tool, which is standard plus PF. The standard plus PF database is one of the databases standard in Kraken 2 that you can directly choose within the tool arguments. It's similar like Calimary within a lot of um, um, sequences or known taxes that you can assign the reads to. Um, both of the database are are chosen in the, um, or are used in our workflow or the bigger workflow. Calimary was used in the pre-processing and now we are using the standard plus PF. So actually we choose this database after we tried a lot of other databases. And the only difference from Calimary and standard plus PF is that we found that standard plus PF were able to find more or was able to assign more reads to the um, uh, to the specific taxes, so we got more assigned and more known reads to the taxonomy uh, levels, which we found much better. And for Calimary, Calimary is better actually into um, significantly say if whether or not it's Homo sapiens, whether or not it's chicken. So it's more specific in terms of host filtering. So in all, all over the output of your workflow, in the full workflow, you'll have the output of Calimary and plus PF with Kraken 2. So you can go on and see the differences yourself. So for here, we're going to be choosing a standard plus PF from the standard from the Kraken 2 run of the taxonomy profiling part. So again, what you're going to do is to, do to download this workflow. This is specialized or written for the taxonomy profiling to do this part. Again, we click on the uh, blue here part and you choose um, um, any place that you want to download in and then you press save. Again, in Galaxy, you go into workflow and then you import from uh, your um, locally, your local drive and you choose your um, workflow you have just downloaded. For me, it's downloaded before, so I will go directly and run it. So, so again, after uploading your uh, or importing your workflow, you will find it here along, along with all the list of workflows that you created or you have uploaded it before or imported it before. So,
So all I did that I pressed play, run the workflow, and now I will give it again. Both of the um, filtered or pre-processed reads from both of the barcodes and its name is nanopore process sequence reads these are the reads that are you're going to be using throughout the whole other analysis so a small chart that will help you understand better what um, about the workflows that we have been running today is this one so what we did now before was running a workflow which is called pre-processing where we um, had the output which is called nanopore process sequence reads for both barcodes, barcode 10 and barcode 11. And if you have 10 samples, you'll be having nanopore process sequence reads once for every sample or once for every file. And again, in the next version of the prof uh, of this training, when you have a collection, you then have a collection of the nanopore process sequence reads, and each one will be named with the name of the sample name. After having this filtered and uh, trimmed and everything and ready to be processed reads, you have you will run three uh, different workflows actually in parallel. So that's why actually it's one of the um, uh, um, very nice things that we did in this uh, creation of the workflow that you don't have to wait for one of the um, workflows to finish in order to run the other. All you have to wait is in the beginning for the pre-processing to finish, and then you run all the three in parallel or any any one of the parts alone based on your application afterwards. So what we'll be running to now is the taxonomy profiling, where we will learn more and more about the reads that we have and maybe um, know what are the oldest uh, species that we have Ready, we can have um, an overview from running it before in the pre-processing, but now we get more and more classified reads by using standard plus PF. And it's uh, actually a step into identifying the bacteria um, or the species of might or not might not be a pathogen. So let's go again to Galaxy and complete running the um, taxonomy profiling workflow. So we will choose this one first for barcode 11. And by pressing on control, you choose dataset number 26 again, which is the same uh, thing exactly, but for barcode 10. Here, we are using um, a tool to visualize the taxonomy instead of uh, looking at it from, um, uh, from the tabula form by Kraken 2. We, we use some of the interactive tools in Galaxy. That tool is called Finch. And this tool actually is really nice in visualizing by different figures and graphs, and you can uh, export them all. You can, by sharing your history, you can share all these uh, analysis and all the, these nice figures, which you can play also around all the time and, and be interactive with and learn more about your reads visually through using this tool and using your history and your output and so on. So this tool specifically uses um, can uh, take also as metadata of your sample. So if you have metadata like the time of sequencing, um, maybe the host uh, that it was, um, if you know a roughly idea about the host, anything that you know about your data sets in prior, you can have it as a, in a tabula file or in a CSV file, and then you can upload it here as well in running this workflow. And then it will be part of your report in the Finch um, uh, visualization tool. So now I will not add here. It's an option. So I will not add it. I will only choose the process uh, nanopore process sequence read for barcode 10 and barcode 11 and proceed by running the workflow. One of the things that uh, Finch um, has is that it can be visualized using Chrome. So if you are using Firefox now or something and you want to view the Finch output, it's preferably that you um, that you see it throughout Chrome. And another tool that you can use in order to do the taxonomy profiling is a Corona pie, pie chart. It's always good to see and visualize it also using Corona. However, uh, because we in our samples, we have a very uh, huge number of um, assigned reads and a lot of assignations. So the data set is actually very huge to Corona pie chart to be drawn in, a, in, a, in the figure of Corona pie chart. So that's why also we have used Finch visualization tool. Also another uh, tool that can replace uh, Finch is Pavian that you can also read about it here and know more about it. And you can also replace Finch with it. So they both um, 
do the same or they can both work the same exactly. Finch visualization tool takes a biome file. So in order or part of this workflow is that we take the output of Kraken to a tool, which is um, mainly tabulas, and then we change it into biome files in order to be read by Finch visualization tool. And to do so, we have in, um, um, installed another tool in Galaxy called Kraken Biome. And this Kraken Biome convert the output as well as taking the uh, the metadata file into our uh, into also finish visualization tool. Yeah. So what you did now is running the the workflow. You can uh, wait for it, but for me now, I will go on directly to the output in order we can to see the finish visualization tool. But as I told you, I will switch quickly to Chrome and come back. Now I moved in or switched to Chrome in order to visualize Finch output. And I've also opened the history where the output from the taxonomy profiling is. So after you wait for your history to, to finish, you will find the same things. As you can see here, the Finch tool is in the yellow state and it will always be in the yellow state as long as it's still running. So it's an interactive tool and I will show you how you will open it through within Galaxy and it would be always in the yellow state as long as it's running. And when it's so, um, when the time is up or something, there is a time frame in Galaxy when the active interactive tools will stop in Galaxy, it will return red or green based on the state. And if you want to rerun it again to see and, and use and look at the figures again, all you have to do is this rerun button that will run exactly the same tool again. So let's go back to the questions part to see what other questions that we should answer first before we look at the Finch um, output. So the questions that you have in Kraken 2 is to check the, in the taxonomy profiling part, is to check the output of the Kraken 2 report for the bark of 10. And the questions are, what is the most commonly found species? and the second most commonly found species. So, and with how many sequences, for example, that we can found. So let's go to the Kraken to output report for Borco 10. Yeah, as you can see here, um, the mostly found domain actually is bacteria. And if you went down into the S, which is species, the mostly found species will be Asertia culai with the total number of sequences uh, 10,243. And if you went down and down and down again until you <clears throat> meet the second uh, species or uh, not the strain, but the species, you'll find that there is uh, the group Salmonella and then the species Salmonella enterechia and the number of sequences are 7,458 that are found in your reads with the standard database, standard plus PF database that are or can be assigned to the Salmonella species. So, and that's for the barcode 10. Yeah, so now you are good with the answer. So let's to see the solution, see whether we were correct or not. So yes, the firstly most found is Kulai with this number of sequences, which is the same as we found. Same for Salmonella, the mostly secondly most <clears throat> found species within our uh, reads or sequences of the barcode 10 sample. Now let's answer the third question, which is how many sequences are classified and how many are non-classified? This actually, you can answer it from here. When you press on the tool itself, for example, here, the reports part, and you scroll, you can see a lot of percentages or an overview or a summary of the report itself. So as you can see here, <clears throat> it's 40,143 sequences were classified, almost 44% of the reads in the sample are classified and 50,455 sequences were unclassified, which is 55% of the reads. So let's see the answer. And yes, it's exactly as we found in our solution. The last question is actually to compare between the Kraken two tools, both runs that you did in the pre-processing using the Calimary database 
And this run in the taxonomy profiling where you use the standard plus PF. So to do so, you can go to your history where you run the pre-processing to check the Kraken 2 report for barcode 10 using Calimary, the one that you did in the pre-processing and answer the same questions. And here you, it's written that the, also the firstly, it's detected with the, the Calimary database as well. The firstly most found species is Kulai, but with these number of sequences. So in this case, more sequences were classified by Calimary to Kulai than the standard plus PF. And same for the uh, Salmonella, it's the secondly most uh, found species in the sample barcode 10 with these number of sequences, also higher than the number of sequences found by standard plus PF. Now to the second part, which is the classified and the unclassified, you'll find that the number of uh, classified sequences using Calimary database uh, are uh, 32,000, which is much, much less than um, the classified, which is 40,000, not much less, but still a lot of much less, uh, <clears throat> which are found by standard plus PF. And actually, that's the reason why we uh, decided to proceed in the taxonomy profiling with uh, standard plus PF, because it was able to uh, assign more sequences. So in this part specifically, all what we're trying to do is to learn what are the species level that we have until the species level, what are the bacteria, for example, that might be there. So you can choose whatever built-in um, database that are already existing in Kraken 2, or you can move on and um, upload your um, uh, filtering or the uh, your database that can classify into Texas, like we did with Calimary. So feel free to update this part with whatever database you find most suitable to your samples. Now to the most interesting part, the Finch visualization tool. Um, and <clears throat> let's see how can we uh, open them within the Galaxy. All what you have to do is that you go to user and then at the bottom, very far bottom, there is an active interactive tools. You press on it. And there you will find all the interactive tools that are running or stopped already was running, but stopped in Galaxy within the, the time where you're running your uh, tools in Galaxy or you're having your history. So here I have it twice. And that's why uh, that's because I have it twice here, once for every sample, once for work at 10 and once for work at 11. I'll move on to click one of them. So it opens another page, which is for Finch. And as you can see here on the, on the very far uh, left, there is um, uh, all the uh, um, tabular uh, columns that you, if you uploaded a metadata tabula CSV file and you had like ID and um, a time, location, all the metadata for the sample and you upload the metadata file along with your um, the, the sample itself, it will appear here and you can choose or, or not choose to view them along with the figures afterwards. So if, for example, you have time and location and I clicked on them and you proceed to the gallery, you will find them along with the figures. So you can export them anytime, you can share them and all the metadata that you have with the sample will be viewed with the visualization as well. So let's proceed to gallery to see the figures that we can view. So all of these visualization techniques you can use and you can share and you can play around with to share with um, with uh, your professors or or share with your research or with your work in general. And you can also, it's an interactive, you can go on and check from the, for example, in the taxonomy bar chart, you can check from the kingdom to the species level. You can present with the value or the percentages. You can check by name or by ID. So you can play around with a lot of things. And also there was here a top sequences part where you can also view what, you, what we have already read in the report, what is the most commonly species and with how many number of species, same exactly as we read in the report, what is the secondly most and how many species and so on. Same if we did the same for the barcode 11. You, uh, we can press here and then we can proceed to gallery taxonomy bar chart and we go to up down to the species level and we present the top um, top 
sequences. Here, the most top sequence is the bacteria Salmonella, secondly, and so on, with these number of sequences that are assigned to this taxa. So that's how the Finch tool is really cool to, to view. And it's actually a very good overview about the might be or might not be a pathogen. So for the next steps, you'll see that we'll start identifying really what are the pathogens, whether or not the bacteria that we have are pathogens or not. But until now, it's good enough to, to see and visualize what are the bacteria and what might be or might not be um, a pathogen. So back to uh, the um, uh, Firefox, or if you want to continue in Chrome, in Chrome, it's up to you. And I will be back again. So back from the taxonomy profiling, where we have seen all these uh, nice figures uh, representing all the different taxa in our samples from uh, the kingdom down to the species level. And uh, we have learned how to, to check uh, the number of sequences and the different types of database in Kraken 2. Now to the core of our training today, where we will identify all the pathogens that we may found agnostically. So in the taxonomy profiling, we have seen that we have a lot of bacteria in the species level. Now let's identify whether these bacteria has pathogens or are pathogens or not. So back to the uh, nice figure um, to see where we are. So now we have, or we have, we are done with the pre-processing, and um, as we said, that we will be running three different workflows in parallel. We have finished the taxonomy profiling. Now we will be running the gene-based pathogenic identification. In this workflow, we will be identifying pathogens, and we will do um, other types of analysis. I will be telling you now, and the output of this. Uh, workflow will be all taken to draw all uh, or visualize the pathogens of all the samples together. So the gene-based pathogenic identification will give you whether or not there is a pathogen or um, and where exactly this pathogen is found in the sequence for every sample separately. Or so we run it separately on every sample. And to in order to visualize it for all samples together and compare samples along all together and know at which time point, for example, uh, the pathogen took place, in which sample the pathogen started to appear, and so on. From all the samples that you can take in real life, we have to run this final workflow that we will run at the very end of the training today, which will compare or visualize all the samples uh, pathogens found together. And the last one, or, or uh, the one before the last, is a different analysis that we're going to talk about later, which is the SMP-based uh, pathogenic identification. So now in the gene-based pathogenic identification, let's see how will we uh, identify the pathogens. So to do so, we um, decided to identify them by detecting uh, whether or not we have virulence factor. So virulence factors are gene products, usually proteins, and they are always involved in the pathogenicity. So by calling a pathogen or by saying that in this uh, position in the sequence we have a pathogen, then we are, or we have a virulence factor, then we say that we have a pathogen. So um, this is the way where we decided to identify pathogens in this workflow. So the analysis that we do here is not only identifying the pathogens, but also some other analysis like identifying the antimicrobial resistance genes that are found in our samples, also identifying the uh, stereotyping uh, or sequence typing schema by um, searching the database, multi local sequence typing database for the schema. We uh, also do, or in order to do all of that in the beginning, we do the assembly from the filtered or processed reads that we have in the beginning. So the output from the pre-processing, as we said, are the, um, are the processed reads or filtered reads from the host, which are the chicken and milk and meat. Now we have this FOSQ files, what we have we, of reads, of very short reads. Now what we are going to do is to build context. So contexts are the reads concatenated together, forming part of the sequence or what might be a sequence. So as you learned previously, maybe in a in a in an earlier training, mapping, for example. So to map 
what we do here that we have a reference genome and then we map the reads that we have to the reference genome so at the end from the reads what we that we have they are now arranged in a such a way that we say that this is the genome sequence of our sample but here we uh, are working agnostically so we don't want to use any reference uh genome so we don't know which pathogens that we might have or we know nothing, we want to work agnostically to discover everything that we might find in the sample. So what we are doing now is instead of the reference genome is that we do assembly or context building <clears throat> where we concatenate the reads together and build up or using a lot of algorithms actually that are ready there to build up and uh, form the bigger parts of the reads which are where we call context. So to do so, there are a lot of tools, and the tool that we're going to use here is Metafili. And then to polish the assembly or to improve the quality of the assembly, we uh, we decided to use Medaka consensus pipeline. And for that, we can visualize the output of the assembly using one of the tools in Galaxy called Bandage Image. For the MLST or searching the multi lucas sequence typing database, there is a tool in Galaxy doing so called MLST tool. And finally, to or before uh, before the last, to identify the antimicrobial resistant genes, we used a tool called Abrigate. This tool has a lot of databases that you can use and and do analysis with. And one of them is the AMR database that we used in order to identify the AMR genes. And finally, and the main main core of our training today is to identify the virulence factor using again abrogate but now we use one another database of it which is virulence factor database and using some tool uh, tabular manipulation tools like the one we use in the pre-processing we uh, played around with all the reports tabula of the samples and made them prepared for the final or last workflow that we'll be running today at the end of the training to use it in order to visualize all the samples together so let's start the first thing that before we start, we need to upload in our history is a file or a tabular file for uh, the MLST tool. The output of MLST tool has no header. So that's why we decided to create a header for it to make it more readable for any report we create. So the first step that we're going to do is to copy the link to uh, upload to our history. We go to upload data and then we paste and fetch the data and we paste it here and make sure to change the type of it to tabula tabula here and press start <clears throat> now the next step is to go and download the workflow and upload it like we did before in order to run it so we go to this workflow it downloads here Then we go to the workflow section. We press import. We import it from locally where you have saved the workflow. For me, it's there, so I will not do it. And then finally, you press on import workflow. Then it will open up the workflow area again. And if not, just go for it. The workflow area you will find it on the very top of your this list where you have all the imported uh, workflows or all your made workflows in your account in Galaxy. So here I will run it. It's called Nanopore Dataset Gene-Based Pathogenic Identification Imported from Uploaded File in your case. So we press Run Workflow. Here I'm going to give it one file by one file. It's not, uh, I will not choose multiple file as we did before. Now I'll choose it one by one because I want to give for every one of the sample, a sample ID, which can be used afterwards in uh, the visualization of all the samples together. However, in the new version that I told you about of the workflow or the other section that I told you about that it will be added soon into the training material, um, where you will be able to run a complete collection as a whole. This collection will include, will automatically detect the sample ID or the workflow will then be updated to take this, uh, the, this collection and automatically detect the sample ID. So in this case, we'll be only uploading or working with a collection 
without doing it multiple times for every sample and without writing a sample ID every time for every sample. So stay tuned for the newest version or the update of the workflows and the newest version of the training materials very soon. So for this case, I will just choose the nanopore process sequence reads, which is data set number 26. That's for barcode 10, and I will give it an ID, barcode 10 spike 2 for example, and then I will choose the uploaded MLST report header and I will run the workflow. Afterwards, I will, and it will run and take its time to, to be here. However, I will run it again for the second sample, which is the, um, the barcode 11 sample. So I will go again, run it again. I'll choose data set number 50, I guess now which is this exactly the same nanopore process sequence read, but for barcode 11. <clears throat> and I will give it an ID again, barcode 11 spike 2B. And yeah, the same MST report header tabula file. And we run the workflow. For the sake of time, I will be um, going through a history I pre-prepared before, like we did in the beginning of the training. And let's check the output of the gene-based pathogen detection together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first part of the training uh, or uh, for this workflow with the gene-based pathogenic identification is the assembly where we created the context. So as we explained in the beginning, the tools that we use is Metafly or in another name, Fly. And then to visualize the output of this tool, we use bandage image and then to polish or before actually visualization, we can do polishing to correct long and uh, error prone nanopore reads. So it's actually specific um, state for the nanopore reads. So let's answer together the questions. How many uh, differing contexts did, get, uh, did the fly get for barcode 10? So let's check. We go down to barcode 10. <clears throat> and we check its fly output FASTA file. And as you will see here, we have 139 sequences. That means that we have 139 different content created in, in, in this fly run. Actually, the workflows now are now updated in the training. So you will get here the same number, 139. However, the answer, I guess, will be slightly different. Yeah. So it's here, uh, an older version of the answer. Uh, I will update that soon. So it's 137 contexts here. So, however, we do have 139. That's the correct answer. So we should find 139 uh, contexts created by Fly. The next question is how many were left after running the polishing by Medaka? So we go again and check it for barcode 10. It's here called uh, sample all contexts. And where we run Medaka, as you can see here, and we found that we have the same number of sequences, 139. So basically, Medaka did not remove anything. So Medaka tool has a lot uh, of arguments where you can set, set a lot of thresholds to keep or remove uh, the context based on your uh, on your goals. And actually, um, what Medaka says have seen that the fly output is good enough that it did not remove any of the uh, reads uh, or any of the contexts that were created by fly in the first place. So the same thing also be written here. And finally, let's check together the graph or of the bandage image, which draw the, the assembly for or the context for barcode 10. Yeah. It's really nice for the uh, reports or for people who are studying the context and simply to view such figures in their reports in the end. So the next part of this workflow is that we wanted to um, search the MLST database for schema uh, and see which schema our sample 
um, is a part of or can be referred to. So let's go and check the output of MLST for barcode 11. So let me show you first without the header, and then let's see it with the header. Yep. That's actually without the header, where we have a report, where we have a sample ID and the schema itself. So it's uh, Salmonella and Turekia as well with a, this name, a schema name where you can go and search for it. I have put a link for that. And let's see the report after we have added the header that we uploaded together. So now we always, just what we did is that the file, that, the tabular file that we uploaded is the, um, the header of the MLST so that when you read it, it's nicer in the, uh, to understand which column refers to. So as you can see here, there is a link so that you can read more about the schema where the barcode 11 was part of by or was found to be related to in the MLST database. The last but not least part of the this um, um, this part of the workflow is to identify the antimicrobial resistant genes. And here we ran an abrogate tool using uh, the AMR Finder Plus database, which is found in the Abrogate tool. And let's see whether or not we had AMR genes and how many did we found by answering this question. So let's check the output of Abrogate for both barcode 10 and barcode 11. So here we go for barcode 11 first. Let's see. Yep. So as you can see here for barcode 11, there is no uh, column or there is no rows found. That means that we have no um, AMR found by the tool abrogate. So there is no AMR genes for the barcode 11. Let's check again for barcode 10, the same exact thing. The AMR identified by NCBI. Here we have a bigger tabula. So now by having these rows, that means that we have found uh, AMR genes or antimicrobial resist, uh, um, resistant genes. And here we have found uh, five. And from this tab tabula, you can learn more about um, this found uh, gene, like in which context it's found in the sequence, from which starting position to which ending position, um, how much or how well is the coverage of the, of the gene and how much percentage of the coverage uh, the accession ID, which is global, you can take and search uh, globally and you'll find which gene exactly we're talking about or which product, uh, what does it resistant against and so on. So that's actually uh, the tabula that you can learn more from the genes that you are found. And maybe people who are uh, experts in the AMR genes will understand this better. So let's go to the next step and uh, see if we answered correctly. Yes, for the barcode 10, we have found five different rows or found genes in different locations and no AMR genes were found for barcode 11. So again, to the main core of the, um, of the training actually, and the main core of this part of the workflow where we find the violence factor or we identify the violence factor to identify the pathogen in the end. So we run again, abrogate using the violence factor database. So let's go and check the output. So for the violence factor, it's the same tool. So you have the same exact column names. So the, the, the which in which context, in which start position, which ending position, the short for the gene name, in which coverage percentages, the accession ID, which is also global. You can take this ID and you will understand more by searching, you'll find the name and exact uh, species and actually up to the strain level identified. So here we have found Salmonella and Turekia and the strain name is LT2. So you have all the information you need to 
to see or uh, to identify to the identified already pathogen. So as you can see, since we have found already VFs for barcode 10, then barcode 10 sample is a pathogenic sample. And here is the strain name of this pathogen. And if there were more than um, one pathogen, you will find here. But since we already know in prior which strain it it's actually was and which uh, species, it will be here only one kind of uh, of species maybe different uh, violence factor or different levels of severity in every uh, in different locations of our sequence. So that's actually a nice tabla, but it will be nicer with a visualization in the last workflow. Let's check it also for barcode 11. Maybe we found, maybe not. So let's check here. And yes, we have also found pathogens and how many. We can check the lines. So we have found 97 uh, lines. So we have found 97 different pathogens for barcode 10. Let's check again because I forgot to check the number. It's 134 different pathogens found or different uh, virulence factors found, identifying that these two samples are actually pathogens. So yes, it's, yeah, numbers need to be updated, but this one at least it's 97 correctly. And this is this one is almost the same. So yeah, now we are done by identifying the pathogen. So now from the taxonomy profiling, we know, knew that we have bacteria. And now we know for sure that these bacteria that we found, one of them is Salmonella, is definitely a pathogen with uh, the strain LT2. So now we have identified agnostically the pathogens and now comes to another type of analysis that we will do together in the next workflow. SMP-based pathogenic identification is our next part of our analysis or the next workflow, the small one that we'll be running together now. So as you remember, it's actually the third one that you can run in parallel after having the pre-processing output or the filtered read that you had in the end. You have these three parallel workflows. We have run already the taxonomy profiling, identifying the bacteria, and all the different other taxas as how and how many reads are assigned to every taxa. And then the gene-based pathogenic identification where we knew that we have pathogens and in which context, in which location, and in every sample separately. And we also have other analysis and you can add whatever tool you want in this part of the workflow. And then you can do other analysis. Now comes to the third workflow that we'll be running after the pre-processing where we will be finding the variants in our uh, sequences. So in this part mainly, it's like, uh, for example, when we have coronaviruses and or uh, SARS-CoV-2 data sets, and uh, you want, or you have a lot of samples, by running this workflow, you can actually find novel alleles and you can find uh, other or new variants of the sequences that you already have. So from this part of the workflow, we are no longer agnostically. We are now having a guess. So for example, when we are guessing that we having Salmonella, the first thing that you have to do is to have the reference genome of Salmonella. And then we do a mapping, the one that you might be have already taken in the previous uh, uh, training, if you have already passed through the previous or the prerequisites of um, the, the, this training. So you have already passed through the mapping. So what we do in the mapping is that you have a reference genome and you have your uh, sequence reads uh, filtered definitely, and then you start to compare. And then after this comparison or by taking the BAM file output of the mapping, you detect the variants. So you see how many um, nucleotides or, or what are the nucleotides that are different from the reference genomes and they are repeated among all the reads. And then you can call them a variant or in a single uh, SMP. So this is actually important, as I told you, to find um, novel alleles and new variants. And it's also important if we are uh, trying to find the pathogens, but not agnostically. So for example, if we have the reference genome of the pathogenic um, sequence, so we have a reference genome of Salmonella with a pathogen, then we uh, map it to the sequence that we have, and we are sure that our reference is pathogen, and then our read is mapped in the location where or the context that we are sure if that they are mapped completely, then this, this will also be a pathogen in our sample. 
So the first step in order to do our SMP calling is to upload our reference genome that we had from public databases and to do so, and we had it here for you. So what all you have to do is to copy here the link for it and import it in, in your history. So you paste and fetch and you paste it here, then you press start. Afterwards, what you have to do is to download your workflow. As we did before, you click on this workflow, this blue button, then you'll have your uh, workflow being downloaded. So I choose the location locally and you press save. For me, I had it before, so I'll not do it again. And then you go to your uh, Galaxy uh, interface again into the workflow area and you press on import. By doing import, you can browse and choose your workflow from the location that you already saved it in. And then for me, I will press cancel. I already have it before. For you, after being here, you press on import workflow, then it will open for you the workflow panel again. If not, just press on the workflow area. It will open all the imported workflows as well as the um, the ones that you, the important ones, the one and also the ones that you have already created before. So all the workflows that you have in your user accounts, you'll find here. So now I will go to the SMP um, in, in based pathogenic uh, identification imported from uploaded file. You may will find it on the top of your list because you have just uploaded it now or imported it now. So you press and run the workflow. And here again, back to the multi uh, uh, multi-file data sets or uh, yep and you choose your pre-processed reads if you did not found it you can click here and uh, choose it yourself so it's uh, the process sequence reads nanopore process sequence reads for barcode 10 and for barcode 11 we choose both of them and by, you can select both of them by pressing on control on your um, keyboard and press OK. And then you choose your reference genome that you have just uploaded, this is at number 74, and you run your workflow. So for the sake of time, again, I will be going to the history that I already pre-created before for the SMP calling and to check the results together. Let's see what are our questions. So speaking firstly about the tools that we use to do every step. So we said at the beginning that we, in order to do the SMP or the variant calling, we need to have a mapping first. For the mapping, as we have uh, nanopore data sets, we used a tool called Minimap2. This tool is used for the nanopore data sets to do exactly uh, the same mapping as the other tools that can be chosen for Illumina sequencing. So if you have Illumina sequencing uh, data set, all you have to do is to replace this minimap tool used for mapping uh, nanopore data sets to other tools that are used for Illumina sequencing data sets. And then you are all good to run the same exact things, things to uh, Illumina sequencing data sets instead of nanopore. Then after you having the BAM file from running the minimap to tool, you do the variant calling step where you have, uh, where we used here uh, a tool called Clear 3. This tool actually is the one used nowadays in the current studies, and it's also up to date and it's always in an update in its uh, version. <clears throat> so it's always under uh, updates and so on. So that's why we prefer to use something with still a contact to the developers of. And we have it on Galaxy as well. So that's why we also use it. Another tool that you can use is Medaka Consensus Tool and Medaka Variant Tool. These tools are also used for the same purpose to find the variant calling and it will have 
it will give you the same results as clear three however they are very very slower than clear three so the time is dramatically different between both of the tools so that's why we kept using clear three instead of medaka consensus tool and medaka variant tool after having the results from the uh, variant calling, we should do normal uh, normalization using the BCF tools, <clears throat> and then we can run some of the filters in order to keep only the better quality or the best quality of the um, of the variants. So after we have a, the output from uh, the clear three or the variant calling, we have a bigger tabula indicating the reference uh, position and the position in our sequence and, and saying that they are different, for example, and what is the quality of identifying them as variant or identifying them as different. And we should be keeping only the ones that are with good quality or passing quality, at least. To do so, we can use either SMP, uh, SIFT filter, or low frec filter, and both of them are exactly, exactly the same in time and results. So you can choose whatever you want to choose. And here we have chosen SMP uh, SIFT filter. So, and finally, for your reports and for reporting, you don't have to export all the tabula with all the details about every single uh, nucleotide or every um, found uh, um, variant. So you don't have to import, report the full row you can choose or the full columns of, the, of all the rows. Here you can choose to create the tabula from this bigger tabula to keep only, for example, the reference, the, the your sequence and the quality, for example, only three columns from all of these columns here. To do so, you can use a tool called SMP extract field. So let's together see and check our results and our tools output and check and see if we can answer these correctly. So the first question is how many variants were found by Claire 3 for barcode 10. So all you have to do is to go to Claire 3 output for barcode 10 and check its output. And you'll find here it's 2,651 lines and 15 comments. 15 comments are mainly the explanation of the ID of every uh, title uh, of the header. So Chrome, what's Chrome is, and um, what's, uh, so every one of the titles can be explained here. What is the first one and every every uh, single letter. So it's just the 15 um, uh, lines or rows for explanation. And starting from here is the 2,651 lines, which are the variants found. So how many variants found is 600, uh, 2,651. Let's see. Here. Yeah, it's a little bit different. That's before filtering because uh, answers are um, the are a little bit late. Uh, uh, late. So now it's if you run it with the current workflows that you have now in the training, you'll find the numbers that we showed previously. It's just a slight difference of one uh, different variant. So the how many variants were found after quality filtering? So let's check. After we run Medaka, what is the results? So remember, it's 2,651. After running the filtration uh, using uh, Medaka, it's 2,488. So after we filtered uh, or removed all the low quality uh, that we had from previously for, from Clear 3, and we now have all the, let's see. Yeah, all the passing quality from the filter, we have instead of 2,600, we have 2,400. So let's check. Yeah, it's quite the same. And what strain, can you detect the strain from this tabula or not? We already knew it from the gene-based uh, uh, pathogenic identification workflow, but you can also see it from here. If you take any one of this accession ID that we also have the same uh, one of uh, from the gene-based pathogenic identification and search for, you'll find that LT2. Uh, and by pressing the link you have in the training, you can go on and read more about this. Yeah, one of the 
things that also this workflow does is to build uh, the full genome or the full, uh, yeah, the full genome of the samples that you have. And why is it important? It's important actually if you want to compare the full um, sequence or the full genome uh, of the samples together in one of the coming steps by drawing phylogenetic trees, for example, of the, the, the samples, all of the samples full genome together. It's really uh, useful when the, the sequence is short, like, um, like in the SARS-CoV-2 case, but for Salmonella, the reference genome or the, the genome of the Salmonella is really big and it will not be that uh, sufficient to draw the full uh, thing for the, the all the samples together, but it's really useful to, um, for example, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, when you have the full genome sequences, you can draw this phylogenetic tree and relate variants together and relate them and see how they are having common ancestors and they are in, from which other variants they are coming from, which are the parents of these variants until you, you reach the final nodes. So it's really nice. But in our case, we'll be also drawing phylogenetic trees, but instead of the full genome, we'll be doing it for the uh, context and the context locations that are having the viral inspector. But this will be in the last step that we'll be doing right now. So the, to check uh, the solution of the last part here, uh, or to do it in the first place, we have run a tool called PCF Tools Consensus that takes the output from the BAM mapping minima, from the Minimap2 tool where we run the mapping using the reference genome of Salmonella and we build the and it builds the uh, full genome sequence of the um, of the sample. So we check it for barcode 11. We go up, up, up to the uh, BCF tool consensus and see its output. And we found out that it gives us two sequences. And the question here is why we have two sequences. The answer is that the, the reference genome that we used to do the mapping, the one that we had from uh, publicly available databases, the one that it's um, uh, public for the, for the Salmonella and or official for Salmonella actually, it has uh, the file of it has two different sequences, same exactly as here. One of them is the complete genome and the other one of them is the plasmid uh, with the plasmid genome. So let me show you. It's a very long file. So I will search by the sign to go quickly in it. Yeah. And as you can see here, the second one of the file is the plasmid uh, uh, genome. So that's why also for the built uh, uh, consensus genome of the um, of the our sample or barcode 11, it's also two uh, sequences. One of them is for the complete genome and the other is for the plasma genome. Now you have reached the final part of your training today, which is the last workflow that we'll be running together, pathogen tracking among all samples. This one, if you remember from this nice uh, figure, that we will be running. You can run actually directly after the gene-based pathogen identification. It will take the output of the gene-based pathogen identification tabulas for all the samples together and group all them, uh, all of them in a collection and manipulate the tabula in a ways, in different ways actually. Then it start the drawing of a heat map and phylogenetic tree or a phylogenetic tree for every uh, identified uh, viral inspector or every identified uh, gene product of a pathogen gene product. So let's see how this workflow works. So basically at the start, uh, if your gene-based pathogenic identification did not finish the running, you can, we can uh, all now go copy uh, uh, these uh, uh, output from the gene-based pathogenic identification, which we will be using in the, the tracking, the pathogenic tracking among all the samples, um, where they will be exactly named like that after uh, you finish the running of the gene-based pathogen identification workflow. Another thing, if you remember, we said already that there will be another uh, version of the training material uh, where we'll be running collections. 
Um, so now these are separate files and we are, what we are going to do now with them is that we will upload them into our history or use them directly if they are finished uh, from the gene-based pathogenic identification and then group every uh, samples in one collection. However, when this uh, new version of the training or the new, so short, long, and the collection version of training is finished, and it will be finished very, very soon, uh, the collections will be there for you directly. So you'll be using the collection directly, which will be outputted from the gene-based pathogenic identification, and you will be able to run um, the full or the... Um, yeah, you will be able to run uh, the workflow without creating the step or by bypassing the step. So by running the collection version or new version of the training, this section will not be there. So let's now copy them to our uh, history. So I will just go and copy all the tabulas together. And I will go to the importing or uploading the data files and I fetch or and paste data. And I paste all the tabulas and I make sure that I set the type of them into tabular. And I will press start. Then I will go on and copy the FASTA files. Remember, these are the contexts created for every sample after running the fly tool in the gene based pathogenic identification. And I will again go and upload them as data sets from here, and this time I don't have to uh, choose a type, it will automatically do that. The next step, as I told you, that we'll be creating collections. So if we are having uh, two samples like now, so every um, two files will be grouped in a collection. However, if we are having 10 samples, it will be grouping of the 10 samples. That's why the collection way in Galaxy is really useful, that you don't have to be grouping every now and then, or you don't have to run uh, the workflow for every sample for writing a sample ID, like we did in a gene-based pathogenic identification. So it's even, even nicer, but still, you'll still have this version if you really want it to run on separate files or if you really want to, uh, to, to do it separately. So now let's create the collection. So to do that, let's group every two files together. Let's go up to see if they're uploaded. So every uh, two contexts, we will group them into a list, build data set list here, and we call them contexts. And we create it. Every two VF accessions for each one of the barcodes, we will group them into a list and we call it, and we call it VF accession IDs. These are the, ex, uh, the accession IDs of all the virulence vector found in both of the samples now after we group them. And the next collection will be the VF accession with sample ID. So let's group them into a list and call them VF accession. I missed a C here, no problem. It's just the collection name with sample ID. And finally, the collection for the VFs themselves here for both of the barcodes. So again, we selected and we build data set lists and we call it VFs. So now we are ready to run our workflow in order to um, visualize all the samples and all the pathogens found together in nice figures. So let's see how can we do that. So the first thing is that we download the workflow because we are doing the short version. So I click on the link here, it downloads into a location and you're locally, and then you import it by going to the workflow part in your top panel of your uh, Galaxy. And then you press on import, you import it from uh, your browse and choose the location where you have, and then you click on import workflow, then it will open the panel again in the workflow uh, area and you will find it on the very top of your list here. But for me, I already have it. So I just go for it and choose it's not a poor data set. Uh, no, not this one. 
However, the longest one, Nanopore dataset reports of all samples along with full genomes and VF gene phylogenetic trees imported from uploaded file. <laughs> so we go on and run this workflow. We'll be simply filling in every collection in its correct place. The context, we'll put in the uh, context collection. VFs, we'll put in the VFs collection. VF accessions, we'll put in the VFs accession collection. Finally, VF accession with ID, we'll put in VF accessions with ID. And then we run the workflow. So the workflow, what it does. The first thing is that it draws a heat map for all the samples that we have along uh, one next to each other. So it does that using a tool which exists in Galaxy called Heatmap with ggplot tool. And what is important in the heat map itself is, for example, when you have 10 different samples collected at different um, 10 time spots. So every uh, hour you decided to collect the sample from the same location, for example. Then by using this heat map, you can see when exactly the pathogen took place. For example, um, along of the day, one of the samples or the contamination happened at this point of time. By the heat map, it will draw all the samples on the x-axis and all the found variance factor or the pathogenic genes on the y-axis and you will see where exactly this specific gene were detected. In our case, we have two samples and both of them are pathogenic and both of them are, um, are salmonella. So let's go and check how this heat map will look like. So for my case, I will not wait for it to run. I'll just go to the uh, history that we created before in advance to see it. So let's go for it. And let's see how the things will look like. Actually, I run in the same, uh, now I run the same workflow in the same history again. So I'll just go and check its results. Ah, no, we are in the SMP calling, that's why. So let's go for the history. <laughs> yeah, so now I will go to the history where I had done this before, which is called all samples for my case. And let's together see the output and check the heat map. So the heat map uh, is run with a ggplot. So let's press on the view. What do we have here? So on the x-axis, we do have the samples with the sample ID we had put, barcode 10, spike 2, and barcode 11, spike 2b. And on the y-axis, <laughs> on, on we have all the accession ID that we have from the tabulas that we uh, had as an output from the abrogate tool, if you remember, from the gene-based pathogenic identification. So what are these red and white spots? So both of the samples are from Salmonella species. And thus, this will indicate why a lot of the red parts are, are common. So red parts are common. If it's common in both of them, that means that this gene or pathogenetic gene um, found or with this um, accession ID is found in both of the samples. And this is mainly because both of them are from the same species, so it makes sense that they share a lot of gene products. 
and some other parts are still white so they are different between some are not found in the barcode 10 but are found in barcode 11 and maybe that's because they are different strains and maybe because this differences some gene products are found in one of the samples and not found in the other but because both of them are all pathogenic you can still see red so in, in the results of the heat map. In another example with, for example, 10 samples with at different locations or at different time spots, you maybe find all white in, in one, in for example, from uh, sample one until sample 10, you will find it all white. Sorry, and from sample one to sample five, you find it all white, no single red dot. And starting from sample six, the red started to appear. That means that at this location where we collected sample six, or at this time where we collected uh, sample six, the pathogen started to take place and appear. So that's our first uh, part of the visualization techniques we have here. The next one is the phylogenetic tree. To draw the phylogenetic tree, we use Clustal W. And then uh, in order to do the multiple sequence alignment, since we have uh, more than one uh, contig from the uh, assembly or the FASTA file that we have before, so we have a lot of, uh, of uh, reads and a lot of contigs or sequences that we want to align in order to draw the phylogenetic tree and relate them to common ancestors and relate samples together. And then after we have them, this multiple sequence alignment, we draw it by fast tree, and then we visualize it using Newick display. So what is the output of the uh, phylogenetic tree? It's actually a collection where we drew a tree for every um, found uh, pathogen. So for every pathogenetic gene product or for every accession ID, we drew a specific tree. So we drew a different tree. So for example, when I clicked on this accession ID, I will check, I'll find that it's only found in barcode 11 and it's found in contig number eight from this starting to ending to this ending position. And again, from this starting to this ending position. So this gene product is found or the, the pathogenic gene product is found only in barcode 11 and it's in contig 8 and, and on different locations on this contig 8. So let's see what do we have in other questions. So we are asked also to check 461819. So let's see what is that. 461819. Yeah, almost here. Here, as you can see, we are having we can found it in barcode 11 as well as in barcode 10 and in barcode 11 it's in contig 1 and in barcode uh, 10 it's in contig 118 and on different locations and if you check more and more you can find them also common in other uh, context number or in other locations on this contact and so on so some of these are the reds so for example, this will be a red location on the, re and on the heat map, which was common between both of the samples. And the one that we checked in the beginning was only found in barcode 11. So it was, it was only red in the second part and white on the first part. So this is, <laughs> sorry, this is also good to be able to compare um, the, the samples together and see how context, some parts of the context are related and how the samples are related. And here you can find a lot of common uh, things between, and this is because of both of them are exactly uh, from the same species, but not from the same strains. So yeah, here was the last type of visualization that you have today. And here are the answers to these questions that you have seen together. So you can check it for all the other um, or the other accession ID. And if you want to know what is this accession ID for, you can just copy paste it to Google. And it's actually worldwide um, accession ID used uh, openly in everything. So you will find it directly once you search it for. Okay, so finally, we have reached the last part of the training today. So let's sum up what we have did. So this figure actually is the more uh, detailed one of the short one that we have here. 
where we run together the pre-processing in order to uh, pre uh, process uh, or retain the quality of the reeds by trimming the bad quality of the reeds of them, the beginning and the ends of the adapters and so on, by removing the hosts of chicken, milk, and and meat or any other host that we are not interested in. And then we take its output to the processed reads uh, to run three different workflows in parallel. We run them one after another, but you can really run them in parallel. You don't have to wait for one of them in order to run the other. Where in the beginning, we did the taxonomy profiling, um, the, defining the our reads into, or assigning the reads into different taxons, and we get more closer to what we do have. So we knew which bacteria do we do have in our samples and how many of the reads are assigned to this bacteria or this species, so from the kingdom down to the species level. Then we identified the pathogens here in the gene-based pathogenic identification for every sample separately. And we have a lot of tabulas and other analysis that we did that we did, and you can also add for your uh, personal or your personalized version of the the workflow. And finally, we did some variant and SMP calling by uh, now that was before agnostically, but now we did it not agnostically using the reference genome in order to find the variants and maybe discover novel alleles or uh, define other variation of the, the sequence or the pathogen. And finally, the last workflow or the fifth workflow after we, the gene-based pathogenic identification where we identified the pathogens agnostically, we take all the tabulas from every, every sample and then we group them together and manipulate these tabulas and visualize them using heat map and phylogenetic tree. And as a reminder, the next version of the training, you won't be uh, running for every sample on its own. You will just be uploading a collection of all the samples to the pre-processing. And then you will have, as a result, the collections uh, for um, as a results from the gene-based pathogenic identification that you will be using directly in the pathogenic tracking without you doing it yourself by grouping the results from the gene-based pathogenic identification into collections to be used in the tracking. So thank you for so much for your uh, listening and doing that by hand. And if you have any questions, feel free to write them here or to ask me personally, and also um, feel free to read all the references. And if you are interested in any of the tools that we use, you can just go on and click on them and you'll find a direct link to their documentation or any of the explanation, I made sure to have all the links there in the training material. So thank you so much and see you in coming trainings. Bye.